You know, I'm beginning to realize <clears throat> a few things with this journey that we call life. The older you get, the more that you begin to realize the wear and tear, you know, that life does. You begin to, in a sense, get weaker in the flesh. But what I have found is that automatically there is this inclination within the believer to rest more heavily upon the Lord. And when you do, you find out there's a strength there greater than your flesh could have ever given. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Now we're going to continue on with <clears throat> understanding the kingdom, and I'm using PowerPoint this morning because there's a couple of things that I want to show you. Because not only do we need to understand um, the kingdom of God and what the Bible says about a lot of things, but we also need to understand where the Luciferian elite, where the uh, occult communities are coming from, because this is all encoded into the same story. And so I want to go back again this morning to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now some of the things that we have already uh, touched on is that one of the things that the, the Nahesh has done now, it's, it's interesting, I got into a, a little bit of a debate on, on Facebook this last week with someone who did not like my analysis of Genesis 1 through 3. And uh, I didn't so much, um, I wasn't so much concerned about his analysis of my exegetical processes, but the tone and the techniques that he was using for his rhetoric, because it was straight out of Saul Alinsky's book, Handbook for Radicals. And what is concern, concerning to me is he was supposed to be, if you will, um, representing the right. And here we are, and here we are using the same techniques. I mean, he starts out by attacking, won't listen to reason, and then comes up with false allegations of things I never said in my sermon to begin with. And it's just ridicule and ridicule, and like he's speaking louder and louder. And when a few days later, we were kind of attacked by the left using the exact same techniques. Uh, it's scary to me when the left and right are both using techniques developed by a guy who dedicated his book to Lucifer. And uh, I kind of think it shows the state of the church that we're in today. And uh, I mean, in this conversation, I got to meet with the vice chancellor of the university where he was attending back in the 90s. And when I shared about how we both agreed on the dangers of regional accreditation and kind of where it's heading, he began tearing apart the former vice chancellor of the own university he's going to. Uh, he's a loose, rabid pit bull in the kingdom of God. And uh, God, of course, God in his grace, I'm now beginning to have several uh, doctoral students come to me from that university wanting to finish their doctorates with us. So God kind of has a way of balancing out the universe, if you will. But we need to understand that this Nahesh, the reason I brought that up is because he said there's no way that, that uh, Adam could have withstood against Lucifer. Well, if you exegete this scripture properly, like I said last week, you cannot just by this scripture say that that was Lucifer. It doesn't, but it is an entity called the Nahesh, which was a, ser a seraphim, or, or if you will, that it was a flaming serpent, it was a flaming dragon, uh, that within, within, the, uh, within the esoteric societies, they also get the concept of uh, the phoenix. And I believe it was one of the many angels that fell with Lucifer. There are many classes of angels, even beyond principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. There's also the watchers. There's the nechash here that we have. And it may be a certain class of, of angel that fell with him because we actually see him show up other times in human history when you look at the mythology of other groups. Now... <coughs> He, what, what, what the Nehesh does, and this, this is the root of everything of evil because he came to infect mankind with the knowledge of evil, is that the first thing he does is he questions the commandments of God. 
How often do we see that in the preaching in pulpits today that we have this jaundice, that we have this prejudice against the commandments of God? That did not begin with Jesus. Jesus was absolutely the opposite of it. The apostle Paul was absolutely the opposite of it. It goes back to the Nehesh in the garden. Not only does he question the uh, commandments of God, he questions the intentions of God. And we have got this dichotomy in, in preaching today that we are so divorced from our Hebraic heritage, we are so divorced from the Old Testament that we act as if Jesus is another God besides the God of the Old Testament. That's Marcionism. In fact, after Marcion was, was kicked out of the church at Antioch and, and, and uh, Polycarp called him the firstborn son of Satan, he went beyond this, this concept of, well, the Old Testament is for the Jews, the New Testament is for Christians. That originated with Marcion. But he went on to say later on that the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, was an evil God that Jesus conquered. And you say, how in the world can that be? Well, we have a Pentecostal denomination today teaching the exact same thing. They have taken Marcionism onto its next step, which Marcion did in his own lifetime. But I believe that all that originates with the Nehesh, the same attitude, the same concept. Now, in the mystery religions, what we're going to see, and I want to show you a couple of picture, pictures here. Uh, Mark Flynn was nice enough to send me uh, his, and this is from his book, he sent the color version of it, of the Nehesh that he had illustrated for, for his book, that is a kind of a phoenix slash fiery serpent type of thing that we see. But we also see up here the, one, the winged or plumed serpent, that's quite a causal. We see after the flood that we have with the Incans, the Mayans, and the Aztecs, they had this serpent, winged serpent god, and it's called Quaticazal. It's also called Amerikuru. That's actually where we derived North America and South America from. It was not from a, 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 uh, a guy that made maps in Europe that actually changed his first name. Because, you know, if you were going to name something, it would be by his last name, not his first name anyway. But within the, the, the land, they actually called the land Amerika because it was named after Amerikuru. That was the plume serpent that in all three of those civilizations, after the flood, they came and said that their land was destroyed by a great flood. Their cities were destroyed by a great flood. And, the, and so they attribute the establishment of their societies to this winged serpent that came after a great flood to reestablish them. And it was the Nehesh or something similar to the Nehesh that came and established those barbaric civilizations that did human sacrifice. They're always bloodthirsty. bloodthirsty. And you'll find most mystery religions will get into human sacrifice and, and these type of things. But also the rising of the phoenix, the same thing, because they're all associated with illumination. In fact, in America, in the founding of America, first, you know, Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey. I mean, oh, that wouldn't, you know, that would have really went over well. Your, your nation is just a turkey. Well, that kind of may fit with some things we're seeing today. But they also wanted the phoenix. And so what they decided to do was to hide the phoenix in the emblem of the eagle. To say one day they were going to collapse America and then as a phoenix raises up out of the ashes afresh, they were going to raise up this utopian society, occult utopian society, that Sir Francis Bacon postulated as the new Atlantis. That's all identified, and all of it originates with the Nehesh of Genesis chapter 3. That's why we need to understand these things. So every single esoteric society, whether it's Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, even major sections of the Roman Catholic Church or Islam, all of them have this esoteric tend that goes back to these three creatures. They came to, to teach another way. I think it's interesting, I was reading this week of um, the prime minister of Turkey that they're actually, within Islam, are beginning to worship him as God. 
And uh, in the picture that I saw online, they actually have him speaking before his parliament or for this huge crowd, and they actually have a hologram of him coming up to stand way up above. And they're saying that he is moving in, uh, in the power of Allah in the Middle East, and it may be the beginnings of the return of the Ottoman Empire or an Islamic empire. And I don't believe it's going to be ISIS. ISIS, I think, is a catalyst that Iran and Iraq are going to be able to be joined to create old Babylon once again. And it's going to be old Babylon and then Turkey with it and then the other things are going to begin coming together. I was sharing with Derek, uh, Derek uh, Gilbert and he has such a better handle on the geopolitical stuff in the Middle East than I do. It's like I was standing there trying to add things as he was running circles around me in the interview because he knows so much more of what's going on over there. But it, it's literally as if you had this Nekesh, this four-dimensional creature reaching down in, th in three-dimensional reality and begin swirling all these different things and it's kind of hard keeping it all together or where it's going. But there's a game plan that the kingdom of darkness is working right now in the Middle East and the elite are going right along with it. <coughs> but I want to look at for a moment. Well, here, here's a couple other things. So now, the, the circled serpent, you see that a lot. In, uh, in esoteric circles. The Abora Aurora. In fact, we get the, the Abora Aurora Alice is actually the shining glimmer, they say, of that serpent that helped that, the Nehesh around the earth. We also have it here in the center. And this is also centered that uh, a symbol of the concept of Middle Earth or the hollow earth, that there's a, another earth on the inside. But it also is identified with illumination. Any time that you deal with, with an esotericism, illumination, they're referring back to the flaming presence of the Nehesh in the garden when he was flaming in the tree. He came to bring illumination from another kingdom. And then, of course, you have the symbol of theosophy here, the same thing. And they kind of tried to unify just a little bit of everything. <coughs> everything from Arabic to the Ankh of Egypt, to also the, the hexagram which the Rothschilds placed upon Israel, as well as did Nazi Germany. And how many know that if there is a symbol for Israel, it's not the hexagram, it should be the menorah, I believe, which was a symbol given by God. But I want to look at, there was a there was a, another nature, there was something that Lucifer created when he fell. And we find this in, in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. We need to understand this because this is what the Nechesh came to offer. As Mark Flynn said, that it, it opened up the door for mankind to be infected with evil. That evil had to originate somewhere. And since there is no shadow of turning in God, God is not like what Zoe Astor said, that he has a good side and an evil side to balance out the universe. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Therefore, evil did not originate in the heart of God. Sinfulness did not originate in the heart of God. It had to originate somewhere else. Aren't you glad that God's not an evil God? He doesn't wake up one day and all of a sudden he decides to be darkness. He is always light. There is never a shadow of turning with him. I'm glad. Now look at this. And, and this is describing the fall of Lucifer. It said, How art thou o, uh, fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which dost weakest the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. Now I want you to underline every time you see the word I will. Because the center of the Antichrist spirit is what came with Lucifer. I will. I will. It's about self. The exaltation of self. He, he was tapping and I said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God or above all the other angels. I'm going to exalt myself. And I will set down upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high God. How many know Lucifer was not created in the image of God? You know, one of the paradoxes I see in the word is he sought to be like the most high God, and after his fall, God came down and created man in his image. You want to talk about a slap upside the head. 
In fact, I, well, let's look first of all, five I wills. Five is the number of grace. Lucifer created a false grace to assist him in his ascension, and it didn't work. This same false grace, which we're going to see here in a moment, became iniquity that the Nehesh offered to Adam and Eve in the garden with the promise of ascending into godhood. You shall be as gods. There's a lot that goes on with that immortality. And I think it's funny that they, he offered immortality to people that were basically immortal. Because actually, from God's point of view, Adam lived to be one day old when he died at 900 and something. He said, in that day thereof that ye eat thereof, ye shall die. The moment he ate of the fruit, he was cut off from God. Death is, is nothing more than separation. The moment they sinned, they were separated from God, but eventually in that day, from God's point of view, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. Because if you operate at the speed of light, that's actually physics has proven this, this that one day would be equal to a thousand years that Adam died in that day from God's point of view. That he was cut off. But he tapped into something. He tapped into, into Lucifer's desire. That when, when Lucifer said, I will five times and tried to ascend, how many know he actually descended? He went up so he could be cast down. But when we look in Ezekiel, we find something else about this time that, that this angel rebelled against God. And this is found in Ezekiel 28, 14, 14 through 16. And it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covers, and I will set thee so. Thou, hast, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in, the way, in, the, in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity. So you started out in perfection, but something called iniquity was discovered in you, revealed in you, that when he did these five I wills, I believe that that anointing that he drew from God, in fact, I was sitting with Carl Koch going over these, thing, these same words where he, he was the anointed cherub that covers, and Carl looked at the word anointed, and his eyes got real big, and he says, that means to draw from Messiah. That he drew from Messiah, that's why he's the Antichrist, he drew from Messiah an anointing to ascend, and instead it perverted, and it created within him something called iniquity. That became his nature. And that's what the Nehesh was offering Adam and Eve in the garden. Now the word iniquity here means injustice, unrighteousness. Now look here at 1A violent deeds of injustice. Whenever you see this nature that the Nehesh offered man, and you see them opposing anything righteous, they will be violent toward it. it they will be violent against it. And is anybody seeing any violent attitudes right now in America over anything the Word of God has to say? In fact, Right now, when, with there, there are activists within the, the gay and lesbian community. Now, let me tell you something. There is no reason ever to treat anybody bad. Now, you can tell them about sin and not treat them bad. Nobody should be treated bad. But activists within it are using this to persecute Christianity because there's a violence in it. Now, historically, let me tell you something. Iniquity within those that call themselves Christians have done many violent things just as bad. But violence does not justify violence. It doesn't. But it talks about injustice. And so this, this iniquity with Lucifer, he violently opposed anything righteous. That is the purest form of iniquity. That is the purest form of everything that, that represents Lucifer. And the moment Adam and Eve sinned, that's what poured into their hearts. That's what became their nature. 
Now, for some people, it's diluted a little bit. For some people, if they give themselves over to iniquity, it will always lead to violent opposition against anything righteous in the world. And always a violent opposition against the word of God. Now, we see a progression in understanding of the word iniquity in Hebrew because it also, there's a, there's a second Hebrew word, avon, which means perversity, uh, depravity, iniquity, guilt, punishment of iniquity. And so we see this same nature, that it, 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 it perverts, it twisted the nature that God placed within Adam to where he, be, that he was twisted toward. That we also need to understand that iniquity is different than sin. Iniquity is the nature that twists you toward sin. Its manifestation is what we call sin. Does everybody understand that? Because we need to understand that Jesus went to the cross to redeem us from sin and to save us from this iniquity nature that was infected in mankind when man fell. Jesus did not come. I'm, I'll, I'll say this. <laughs> I will say this. Jesus did not come to save you from hell. Hell is a consequence. He came to save you from the nature of hell within he came to save you from iniquity, from sin. And if we're preaching a gospel that Jesus did not come to save you from standing against the law and being violent against the commandments of God, which is the very definition of sin, then you're not preaching the gospel. And if you have listened to another gospel that said that Jesus came either to, to sa save you from your bad feelings because you're being made emotionally feel bad at this moment by the preaching that's going on, or to save you from hell, perhaps you're not even saved because it was on the wrong premise. He came to save you from the sin nature that was imparted into Adam and Eve when they sinned against God and iniquity was found in them because they received a false grace, a doctrine of the knowledge of good and evil and that they could become as gods. Now let's take this a little further. Can you see why I'm trying to build this? If you don't understand these basic things, you don't understand a lot of the concepts that are going throughout the Word of God, nor do you understand what the mystery religions are doing. They're trying to bring iniquity to its fulfillment in which they believe they'll become as gods. And they've got to fill the earth with iniquity to bring it to such a place that the king despot can come back. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But here it talks about the son of perdition, this king despot. Now listen to what it says about him. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. How many know we're kind of seeing a falling away right now? They didn't leave church. They just, the church fell with it. They left the truth but still called themselves the church. We're seeing that in a greater magnitude, I think, than ever before. But looks what it, what it calls the son of perdition, that the man of sin. He will be sin personified, the son of perdition. Now this word sin here literally means to miss the mark, to wander away from the path of righteousness, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. Sin, biblically, when you, when you look at the Greek or you look at the Hebrew, literally means that you're opposed to the law of God. There's antinomianism going on here. You say, why, why are you harping on this so much? Because much of the preaching today falls in line with the doctrines of the son of perdition more than it does the doctrines of Messiah. If you are opposed to the law of God, that is antinomianism. And Jesus said, in those days, you will come to me and say, Lord, have we built great mega churches in your name? Have we not fed the poor in your name? Have we not done all these wonderful works in your name? And he will say, I never knew you depart from me, those that were opposed to the law, those that are workers of iniquity, those that are antinomian, those that aligned themselves with the Antichrist and didn't even know it. 
they align themselves with the Nehesh and with the teachings that he came to give mankind. This is precept upon precept. You've got to know what you're saved from before you can really know what you were saved to. You've got to fully, you know, when I was in the military, we had to fully define what communism was compared to what Americans believed. Although that, how many know that's been blurred? I was in the military back in the 80s. Things have gotten, 70s and 80s, things have gotten crazy now. Now we have our leaders spouting Marxism and communism saying that's the way to go. Back when I was in the military, that was defined as bad with a capital B. And as far as I am as a former American soldier, it still is. Because I know theologically, communism is one step away from Luciferianism. It's a progression. Progressivism, socialism, communism, then Luciferianism. In fact, if you look at the Communist Manifesto, set it side by side with the, with the principles of the Illuminati as set by Adam Weishaupt, and they are point by point identical. It wasn't anything new. Marx simply took what Weishaupt started and took it to another level. Just thought I'd throw that in there. It's time for us to open up our eyes and find out what's going on in the world. The Nehesh is working hard to bring about the final end. But yet God gives us a promise. Aren't you glad, you know, God could have came in and said, you know what, Adam, I told you that the day that you ate thereof, you're a dead man, and I'm here to kill you. I'm going to wipe you out, and I'm going to set up some new ones. With a warning, you know, this could have been a warning. Remember Adam and Eve. God came down, God killed them, and set up, created new ones. And pointed and said, see those two dead bodies over there? You ever eat of that tree? I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill you just like I did them. He could have done that. But I love what the Almighty does. And I've shared many times when the moment that God created man, he called himself Yahweh Elohim. Before that, it was only Elohim because he balanced justice and mercy together. And so Almighty God comes in the garden and says, okay, you ate of the tree, didn't you? I love how Dr. Carl Koch translates that because, you know, in the King James, it says, Adam, where art thou? Carl, and only the way he can do it, he says, listen, in the Hebrew, God comes down, looks around, and says, hey, Adam, how's that working out for you? <laughs> so you wanted to become a god? Now you're hiding in a bush. How did that work out for you? See, when God really comes on the scene that nature will cause you to run and hide. Because if that nature gets too close to the manifested presence of God, it will kill you, just like God said it would. That's why the high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, had to have a rope tied around his foot because if he did not have that nature covered by the blood, it would kill him. See, all this becomes real. You start understanding what's going on. All this really becomes real. And God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the uh, cattle and every beast of, of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go. Dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and Thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, many have tried to come up with what is the seed of the Nehesh, of the serpent. And some have said, well, maybe it's the line of Cain. But sometimes when God talks about seed, now the apostle Paul in Galatians talks about, now that seed was, not, was unto one, not many, and that seed was Jesus. But it also talks about how that we were Saved by the incorruptible seed. There's a double meaning here of this. That there is a seed coming, there is a one coming, the son of perdition, 
that the best he could do, he did at the cross when he bruised the heel of Jesus, but Jesus is gonna crush his head. But at the same time, there is a seed, there is a doctrine, there is an understanding, the teaching of the Nechesh, that man will one day become a God if he simply embraces all the knowledge that these fallen angels have promised. You see, this is important because every single occult society, esoteric society, from Freemason to Russia Christianism, all of them are seeking to rediscover all that knowledge that was going to be given. We're going to get into next week how that, if we get, because I mean, it may take us another week just to get out of Genesis chapter 3. We go to Genesis chapter 6 with the coming of the watchers. They came to give knowledge as well as breeding with women. They came to give this knowledge because in it was a seed that would germinate in the hearts of men. That another name for the Nehesh is Prometheus. Because he came to give the fire of the gods. And we use the metaphor of he came to give physical fire, but occultists know that he came to give illumination from the gods. So Prometheus can refer to both the Nehesh and the watchers of Genesis chapter 6. He said, the best you can do, but there's one coming. God says, I've got this. And because man sinned, woman was deceived, Eve was deceived, Adam was not. That's why it is counted to him as high treason, as well as he was the one commissioned by God to guard the garden. He was a watchman over it. That it was attributed to Adam for sin, but he said, through the seed of the woman, there's one coming, and I'm going to fix this through the one coming. Aren't you glad? We have a type and shadow of the one coming. We celebrate Passover this week. And how fitting because Passover and the whole typology. You see, God's getting ready to judge some things in the earth. Jesus was the Passover lamb. And when God came to judge the Pharaoh... And Pharaoh was the personification of Osiris. He was the personification, if you will. He was a type and shadow of the Antichrist in the Old Testament that was ruling the earth under the wisdom given by the Nehesh and the Watchers that civilization was created. And it first accepted God's people, like it always does, and then it builds its kingdom on the back of God's people because it enslaves God's people. Kind of like right now in America, the esoteric religions use the revivals of Jonathan Edwards to begin building a republic and then slowly turn it into a democracy and now they're turning it into an oligarchy where only the elite rule. And as they do, Christianity is going from the forefront by the morality that we had that now we're becoming slaves to it and we must be, we must be oppressed and brought into line with the Pharaoh's spirit. And just like when God judged Egypt to set God's people free, there's coming a time, I believe, even before the Antichrist and all that, that God is going to judge America. Judgment is coming. Do you hear me? Judgment is coming. But as it does, God has the ability to protect his people while he judges Pharaoh. We have a biblical precedent in the Passover story. That if the blood is over the doorpost, you are protected. God can create Goshen's while he judges Pharaoh. And let me tell you something, for the sake of the remnant, spot judgment must come on America. Otherwise, we have no hope. And what I'm praying and what I'm seeking is God, some of these Luciferian elite and their puppets in the corporate world, in the political world, and in the religious world, in the financial world, have got to be judged so that we can, come, we can come free out of the thumb of the Pharaoh. 
for the sake of the remnant in this nation. I will be as daring as to say, God does not need to use the rapture to protect you. Your protection is what it always has been, the blood of Messiah. That same blood that was shed on the cross. Come on. <laughs> Let's take it one more step. Come on. When the apostle John, or, or John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that takes away that sin nature, that sets you free from the nature of Lucifer, that sets you free from the teachings of the Nahash, that sets you free, that same blood that caused you to become a new creature in Christ Jesus is the same blood that covers you when God pours out judgment that you're safe. It becomes that ark that you can go like Noah. It becomes that house with the Passover blood over the doorpost that it comes across on top of you, but it does not come into your dwelling. That's why we've got to understand these things. Well, Mike, are you preaching a post-tribulational rapture. I'm, I'm, I'm here preaching this. The rapture is big enough to take care of itself. Now, we can fight till we're blue in the face about the timing of it, but it is an academic debate. The debate is not the timing of it. The debate is who you're under. Well, if you're under the blood, if you're looking for that, if you're looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it causes you to purify yourself because you know that you're going to have to answer for what you're doing in this flesh, and you want to bear, you want to appear before the King in proper attire, with those robes that are washed spotless in the blood of Jesus that there's no wrinkle nor spot nor any such thing. And if I know he's coming, I'm getting ready by walking in biblical holiness, bringing everything under the blood and getting free of the doctrines of the Nehesh and the nature of Lucifer that's permeating this world. I want to be free of it. I don't want to have the smell of it, the tint of it, nothing on me because my king is coming and the rapture will happen exactly when it's supposed to. Pre, mid, pre, wrath, or post. It will happen. But here is the thing. When it does happen, you better be found faithful. And you better be found under his blood. And that same blood that will make you rapture ready is that same blood that will make a, a banner over the top of you to protect you as God begins judging things. Come on. My God is big enough to judge the devil and to protect you at the same time. Maybe your God's not that big, but mine is. Because I saw God create Noah's Ark, protected the righteous while an evil world and all the Nephilim and all the other crazy creatures that they had done with their genetic experiments died. I saw God place his hand over little huts in a place called Goshen while he judged the firstborn of Pharaoh himself died because God judged it. But yet those under the blood were protected. And I saw Almighty God do that which blew away the minds of the angels, he came and gave himself as the lamb. That that was divinity, that was eternity flowing down that cross. And by that blood, I have every sin forgiven and I am delivered from the sin nature. Now what we've got to do spiritually, the moment that we make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of our lives, our spirit men are reconnected to God. I am delivered from that sin nature, but that old nature is still embedded in the soul. That's why I've got to get back in the book and have my mind washed with the water of the word to get that old sin nature out of my mind. But aren't you glad this morning that Jesus, what he did for us, is enough? It's enough. And to realize it wasn't just about getting 
deliver me from a devil's hell. It was deliver me from the very nature of Lucifer himself when he died on that cross. That's what baptism represents. I've died to my old self, and I have now resurrected into a newness of life by the very life of God flowing through me, this divine nature, the nature of Jesus flowing through me is the gospel story. And it all started in the garden. And if you want illumination, I'm not after a guy who can just light up a tree. I like what God did. He showed up in the burning bush. And I really think Moses was intending on going, taking them up there and saying, guys, there's this bush. It is so cool. It, it, it's a fire, but it doesn't burn up. And he gets there, and God says, you want to see illumination? The entire mountain was on fire. I don't care about who can light up a tree. I serve the one who lights the world and lights up a mountain so much that Moses feared and trembled. <laughs> I wish I could have seen his face when he realized God didn't lighten up a bush this time. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's the one that sent me. Woo-wee. That's the God. That's why in the book of Hebrews is God is shaking not only the earth, but he will shake the heavens. Oh, I want to preach about where I'm going to get in about 10 weeks because it's so good when you get in the book of Revelation. But he reminds us, he ends that passage with our God is a consuming fire. There's no fallen angel has anything on our God. Not even close. So we just need to ask ourselves this morning, is the blood over our doorpost? Have I been delivered from sin? Not hell, sin. Because I've accepted God's Passover lamb. The moment that they nailed Jesus to the cross, the cross became the doorpost of planet Earth. And hung on the place where God placed his name. And if you look at the mountain range in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is actually on three mountains, and it forms a sheen. It was God's mezuzah. God was saying even long before, when he brought Abraham to that place that he was going to offer Isaac, God's sheen was in that place, and God says, this is my doorpost to planet Earth. And then he went there and took the blood of the Lamb and placed it upon the doorpost of planet Earth. And he said, all those who come under the blood, when I send forth the death angel to judge, I've got you covered. I've got you covered. Father, this morning, Father, we recognize that Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh, that he gave his life for us, that his blood sets us free of the sin nature. And Father, this morning we ask that the blood of Messiah, the blood of the Lamb of God would cover us, cover every doorpost in our life, cover every sin. And though our sins be as scarlet, let them be made white as snow by the blood of the Lamb. And Father, we declare before heaven and earth that we trust in the finished work of Jesus. We trust in his blood that was shed for us so that we would no longer oppose your commandments, but that we begin walking in them again, that we could be your watchmen and your servants in the earth today. We thank you. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name.